initiative and me if you'd like to learn more about the Kelp Network. Okay, and with that, I'm not going to read this whole slide out. I was hopefully you kind of read this, and this is why you're here today. Um, but we're really excited again to have Renee and Julie come speak with us about how they've documented the underwater world of shellfish farms. Um, the Milford Lab, where they work, was has been able to collect videos on oyster cages in Milford, Connecticut, to help them better understand fish behavior around the cages. Um, spoiler alert, it seems like their results show that multi-tiered oyster aquaculture cages do contribute a uh, complex structure to seafloor environments and improve habitat quality and ecosystem services. And so Julie and Renee will get more into that. So quick bios for both of them. Julie Rose is a research ecologist at the Northeast Fishery Science Center in Milford Lab, where she's focused on shellfish aquaculture and supports a variety of stakeholders in the aquaculture community. Julie has a bachelor's in biology and in, 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 in English from LaSalle University and a PhD in marine environmental biology from the University of Southern California. And Renee Marcaldo Allen is a research fishery biologist at Milford Lab, where her research is also focused on aquaculture and the environment. And with Julie, she co-leads a team that studies fish interactions with aquaculture gear. Renee has a bachelor's degree in field biology and human ecology from Connecticut College and a master's in biology from Southern Connecticut University. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screens. Renee and Julie, feel free to um, start sharing your slides and go ahead and get started and thanks again. All right, great. So here we go. Can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. So go ahead, Renee, if you're, you wanna kick it off? <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us. We can have the first slide. There we go. Julie and I would like to begin by expressing appreciation to our GoPro project team. This project really took a village, and we're grateful to each of them for their many contributions. We're also grateful to our industry partners who allowed us to place our aquaculture gear on their shellfish farms. There is growing anecdotal and scientific evidence that shellfish farms function much like artificial reefs, providing habitat benefits to fish. In fact, shellfish growers routinely report fish in and around their oyster cages. And here we have some video of an oyster cage. You can see some young of the year scup schooling. A couple of tatag are coming through now. And there's a predatory bluefish in the background there. You can see there's a lot of growth on the cage that the fish can use as a source of food. To better understand fish interactions with aquaculture gear, we've been studying shelf and bag style oyster aquaculture cages. These are becoming popular because you can grow more oysters on a smaller geographic footprint than traditional on-bottom oyster culture, where oysters are spread across the sea floor. These cages measure four by three by two feet. They have three open shelves. The shelves have two bags of oysters. The bags contain anywhere from 100 to 200 oysters. And the cages create openings of various sizes that add complex multidimensional structure to the sea floor. So we have a couple of project goals to quantify habitat services provided to fish by oyster cages, to provide data to regulators and resource managers who make decisions about aquaculture practices, and to make our video and methods publicly available. So we've been using a number of metrics to assess the role of oyster cages as fish habitat. Um, we've used fish abundance and community composition, and those are both really common metrics that are used and have been widely reported in the literature previously. But from conversations with our resource manager partners, we have heard that they are interested in going beyond abundance and community composition to understand how cages are functioning as habitat. And so we've also worked to quantify behaviors associated with habitat use of structures um, such as aquaculture gear, and um, we've also gone further within our fish abundance uh, estimates to separate fish out into different life history stages. 
Uh, we've looked at, or we've conducted uh, four studies uh, to date um, within this overall project. So, and we have time to talk about two of them today, but I did at least want to mention all four for your awareness. So we have looked at oyster cages on shellfish farms and compared them to fish activity on boulders on rock reefs, which is the natural structured control habitat that we have access to in Connecticut. We've also looked at cages across multiple farms to start to get a sense for geographic variability in habitat provisioning. We've looked at two styles of off-bottom cages, and we've looked at seasonal and interannual variability within a single farm. So we've taken the same approach, the same overall approach as we've um, uh, as we have done these um, different studies. And so I want to walk through in the next couple of slides sort of the general methodological approach we've taken. So we use uh, GoPro Hero cameras, uh, GoPro Hero 3 plus silver cameras. And when we're deploying cameras on cages, we have two per cage. So one is in the top is the top camera, which is positioned looking across the top like a periscope. Um, and the second camera is a side camera that's attached at the opposite corner and hangs down and gives us a view of two sides of the cage and where the cage meets the seafloor. And so if we pull these two images together, we can see about half of, um, of the cage at any given time. Uh, when we've been working with natural structured habitat, we created a minimal a uh, minimal structure mounting system that we call a T-platform camera stand. And so I have a picture of that on the left here. So it's a threaded pipe with a weighted base. And what this structure does is give us the ability to view individual boulders within a rock reef environment using the same perspective that we get for the cameras that are attached to our cages. And so um, another detail that's important is that these T-platforms get put out at the beginning of the field season. They're left there throughout the course of the field season. And so during the deployments, it's just the cameras that are getting clipped on or taken off by divers. A few additional deployment details. So we use intervalometers for two reasons. Um, these are timers that allow us to delay the onset of our video recording for 24 hours. We do this to try to minimize disturbance effects in our video from the deployment itself. We also are able to collect video in eight minute intervals every hour over 13 hours. And so this lets us extend our camera battery life and it gives us a picture of fish activity over a full tidal cycle as well as a complete day. We use a magenta filter to reduce the natural green coloration that we get in our videos. We also use um, external sensors to measure current speed, light intensity and seawater temperature during our deployments. We analyze our video using a software program called Observer XT. This allows us to review our videos time synced, um, both from the top and the side camera simultaneously. Uh, we've been scoring all of our videos for fish abundance, and we've been scoring a subset of them for fish behavior. So our uh, 2018 study was a habitat comparison, and this was all conducted within a single embayment in Connecticut in Long Island Sound. So we had three sites within that embayment. One was a dense, what we called a dense cage farm site. So we had our four study cages that were deployed on a commercial oyster farm that had at least 40 cages at any given time throughout our field season. We had a second cage or a second site that we called our sparse cage farm site where we deployed four single cages on low release seafloor. And then we had a third site that was a rock reef and we sampled or we collected video from four boulders and there were no cages in this, um, at this location. We did weekly camera deployments in 2018. Um, we were interested in temporal variability on the farm, and so we did 17 weekly deployments from June through September and into early October. Um, and then we paired these weekly uh, dense cage farm deployments with either the rock reef or the sparse cage farm. And so we have eight deployments from the sparse cage farm and nine from the rock reef. In 2019, we looked across three farms in Long Island Sound. So for those of you who may not be familiar with this part of the country, we're in, um, I've got an orienting map here on the top right. We're in the northeastern United States. Long Island Sound is located between the states of Connecticut and New York. And we've been working in the central western sound um, in the towns of Milford, Westport, and Norwalk. In this uh, study, we deployed cameras on two cages within each of these three farms, and we conducted a time series of seven camera deployments from June through September. To date, we've seen 21 different fish species in our videos, with black sea bass, cunner, scup, and tatog being the four most abundant species. 
Visibility on Long Island Sound can sometimes be challenging, so we used a variety of characteristics to identify and distinguish between the fish species, including body size, shape, and coloration, certain unique physical characteristics, and distinctive swimming movements. So I'm going to talk about these, these four abundant species. Um, the video that's running now shows a group of black sea bass coming out from underneath the cage. Black sea bass have an elongated body, mottled coloration. They have a spiny dorsal fin. The juveniles have a, la a black lateral stripe that runs down the length of their body, which you can see in the right-hand bottom photograph. And the mature males have a, a large forehead bump that often takes on a blue coloration during spawning season, and that's in the top right-hand photo. Hunter's the smallest of the four species that we see. They're olive gray to brown. They have a false black eye spot, and you can see that in the video. Um, that's a good way to, to recognize them. Scup has a silvery coloration, a rounded, rounded body shape, a forked tail, and we sometimes see black vertical banding on their body. The scup in this video is feeding on one of the cage lines, picking tiny colonizing organisms off for food. And finally, Tatog have a blunt snout, pronounced lips. They also have a mottled appearance, but their tail fin is rounder than black sea bass. And this footage is showing some courtship behavior. The small female is being pursued by a large male, and she is taking refuge in the cage. So we have been using a metric for estimating fish abundance that's called MAXN. Um, structured habitats can be challenging to study because um, of the way that fish interact with these structures. So because our cameras are positioned so that we can only see half of a cage or half of a boulder at one time, there's a possibility that fish are regularly swimming in and out of our camera view. And so if we see a fish leave and then we see a fish come back in, we don't necessarily know if it's the same fish or if it's a new fish. And so there's a possibility for double counting um, that would result in an overestimate of uh, fish abundance if we were just to use individual counts of fish. So well, the way that MaxN works is that the MaxN just refers to the maximum number of fish of any given species present within a single frame within each one minute video segment. And so um, what this uh, tells us, so we know that this is a conservative metric and that we may be missing fish, but the advantage of MaxN is that we're confident that this is at least the minimum number of fish that are associated with a structure at any given time. So here's some data from our project. Um, the, this, um, this is a fish abundance, max and abundance for four species. Each of these plots has a different species with time on the x-axis and fish abundance on the y-axis. Um, these figures compare the abundance of these individual species on rock reef, at the rock reef site versus the two cage sites in Milford in 2018. So all of the rock reef data is shown in black, the dense cage farm is shown in blue, and the sparse cage farm is shown in white. And uh, what I'd like you to take away from these figures is that for three of these species, black sea bass, scup, and tatog, there were significantly more fish associated with the two cage farm sites when compared with the rock reef site over the course of the time series. Um, for Connor, there were no statistically significant differences between the cage, farm, the cage sites and the rock reef site. This is a similar set of figures, but in this case, we're comparing abundance across farms in 2019. So again, time is on the x-axis, and abundance of black sea bass, scup, cunner, and tatog are on the y-axis. In these figures, um, the Milford site is shown in blue, the Norwalk site is shown in red, and the Westport site is shown in yellow. And for all four of these fish species, um, we saw no significant difference in fish abundance um, according to farm location across the full time series. We've also been looking at fish behaviors to better understand what services are provided to fish by aquaculture gear. So we've seen a variety of behaviors, including foraging, where fish are picking and eating small organisms growing on the cage, sheltering, where fish are sitting either inside or on top of the cage, station keeping, where fish use small fin movements to stay in place in the currents, escape or retreat into the cage, perhaps being pursued by a predator, we also see grouping or schooling activity, 
courtship and reproductive behavior, and territorial and aggressive displays. We've been assessing behavior in Connor and Scup. Connor is an ecologically important species that's discriminating in its habitat choice. It's highly structure dependent and associated with hard bottom habitat. Scup is a commercially and recreationally important species. It's demersal. We often see it schooling in groups and it's structure associated. So I'm gonna share a couple videos with you. This shows some Connor foraging. This is at the Rock Reef site on a very poor visibility day. But you can see the cunners, you can spot their false eye spot, and they're picking small particles out of the water column. And we often see them swimming facing into the current when they feed. This is a example of a cunner escaping. The cunner is at the top center of the video. And very shortly, a black sea bass is going to turn up on the, on the right of the cunner. And he's going to pursue the cunner. It's going to happen really quick. So be ready. So here comes the black sea bass. Oh, the cunner gets away. Oh. Hang on. Oh, sorry, Renee. I have here we go. Oh, I need to That's okay. get rid of a pointer. Give me one second. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. So we're going to see a cunner shortly. Here's some tatog passing through. And the cunner is going to come up on the right, and he's going to be between the framework of the cage and the, the oyster bag. And you can see him there. He's feeding on some of the organisms. And then he's going to dip down into the cage. So we frequently frequently see schooling in scup. These are young of the year, and they have a very distinctive darting movement when they swim. A couple of large tatog coming through, and that predatory bluefish is in the background there, and I think the, cup, the scup are sticking together. And you can see this cage has quite a bit of colonizing organisms. So here we have some cunner territoriality. The small cunner is being chased off by the large cunner. So in addition to abundance, community composition, and behavior, we've also been looking at young of the year fish. And so this refers to fish that are yet less than a year old. Um, we've heard from our regulatory partners that they're particularly interested in young of the year fish. This is a sensitive early life stage um, larvae are transitioning from the water column and settling on substrate. Uh, as we talked about, we do see a few temperate reef species that are known to be shelter dependent. And um, they are seeking complex structure to serve as a food source, protection from predators, and current flow. Because they're shelter dependent um, and they are known to demonstrate limited movements and they have high site fidelity. And so for these reasons, um, recruitment sex recruitment success has been closely linked to availability of suitable settlement habitat. <clears throat> uh, so here's a video of young of the year black sea bass and scup. And so it starts off with a black sea bass. Um, you can see moving in the front um, of the video and the second one coming in.
And then the second half of the video is uh, primarily SCUP. So young of the year data can be a little bit challenging to manage, and um, there are a few reasons for this. What we found both within a single year as well as across years, there is very high variability, both day to day and year to year, in um, the relative contributions of young of the year to the total fish uh, assemblage um, on our oyster farms. And uh, additionally, they are somewhat ephemeral. These are very seasonally dependent. You only see them for a limited number, a limited window of time across our full time series. And so, so I've chosen one way here of showing Young of the Year data. Um, this is a time series, so each bar represents a different year. So each figure represents a different species. This is Young of the Year data from black sea bass, scup, and tatog. So three of the four uh, species that we routinely see in association with our oyster farms. And each bar represents a different year from 2018, 19, 21, and 22. And so what I've got plotted here is the maximum number of Young of the Year of these species that we saw on any given day or that we saw within one of the days within that year. And so what I want you to take away from that what I want you to take away from this is first that there is a lot of interannual inter variability across years, but there are years where we see a large number of young of the year in an association with a single cage at just one point in time. So, for example, in 2022, we saw um, on one day 22 black sea bass in association with a single cage um, on a single day. And in 2018, we saw 73 young of the year scup in association with a single cage on our oyster farm um, within uh, one deployment date. So there's a lot of variability, but it seems like at times there may be uh, quite a large number of young of the year fish associating with these cages. Uh, additionally, we've been really excited to document um, not just courtship behavior like Renee was describing earlier, but also even um, spawning behavior. So this video is a scup spawning um, in association with our oyster cage beautifully right in front of our camera. <laughs> so what have we learned? Fish are highly abundant in and around oyster cages, and we observe fish of varying sizes and life history stages. Fish behavior relates closely to habitat use, and our results suggest that cages provide habitat quality similar to boulders. In terms of our ongoing research and next steps, last summer in 2022, we conducted stereo camera deployments to collect video for fish size measurements. And our goal is to better understand the size structure of fish communities using cages and boulders as habitat. This coming summer, 2023, we'll be comparing relative condition of fish on shellfish farms and rock reefs to assess habitat quality using energy density analysis and a length weight based condition index. So we've talked a lot um, in the presentation so far about what we've done um, and what we've seen. Um, but we wanted to close out this presentation by talking in a little bit more detail about the ways in which we're trying to communicate our work. So we um, feel we, we publish in the traditional peer reviewed literature. But throughout this project, we've been making an effort to try to communicate in a broad number of ways with a number, targeting a number of different user groups. And so what I wanna walk through in the next few slides are some of the different types of tools that we've developed and where you can find them because they're all uh, freely available on the web. I also wanted to highlight here our uh, website, which um, our amazing science communication specialist, Kristen Javanasi, has kindly put in the chat already. Thank you, Kristen. Um, and also, I'm glad uh, I want to give Kristen a shout out because she has been just incredible to work with as we've been developing a lot of these tools.
So the first one I want to talk about is our um, what we call our citizen science guide. And so we did a lot of research and development in 2017 to test out different types of cameras, different ways of deploying cameras, and different off-the-shelf um, add-ons to GoPros that you can use to record video underwater. And um, this isn't the type of thing that typically gets captured in a peer-reviewed publication. So what we developed was a step-by-step -step guide with pictures and in as much detail as possible. Um, so that any user who's interested could download it and have a good shot at being able to buy a GoPro and deploy it on their oyster farm um, or, you know, in their coastal backyard. Um, and uh, so we've made this uh, document freely available on the web. It's posted to NOAA's um, Office of Aquaculture Library, so I have the QR code here. And also, I should mention everything that I'm going to mention on the next few slides. Um, there are links to these products on our website. Oh, and I also should mention that we keep this updated. So we've been updating the Citizen Science Guide every like one to two years based on additional information that we've learned. Uh, we've also developed a, several um, outreach products. So we worked with the Office of Aquaculture to develop a story map that's called Capturing Life on Shellfish Farms. And so this talks about the work that we've been doing in Connecticut, as well as a related project that was funded by the Office of Aquaculture um, that our colleagues uh, Beth Sanderson and Bridget Ferris conducted in Puget Sound in Washington State. Uh, we also developed some fact sheets. Um, about one is about again the joint project, so the one in Connecticut and the one in Washington State, and then one is specific to our project. And so the QR codes for those here. We've also tried to develop some educational tools as well. So we worked with the uh, publication called the Environmental Science Journal for Kids last fall to take one of our peer-reviewed publications and turn it into a kids journal article that is targeting middle schoolers. And that came out last September and is freely available on the web. Um, my colleague Jillian Phillips also participated in a NOAA Live educational webinar series um, that uh, there was a episode focused on the Milford Lab called Science on the Half Shell, and she talked about our project as part of that webinar series. We've also found that videos are just an incredibly compelling communications tool. And so we've been working to develop and sh to share our video clips and then also try to develop some videos to talk about our work um, just in, in posting them on the web in an attempt to sort of broadly communicate with the, um, with the public. And so on our website, we have a video gallery of some of the cool things that we've seen on the farms that we've been fortunate enough to be able to work on. We also created a um, day in the life, so a field day, like a video recording of a field day, um, which is uh, available um, on YouTube. And then we partnered with the Nature Conservancy, um, who created a video about the work that they're doing with a similar project in Massachusetts, and um, also talked about the work that we've been doing in Connecticut, and that's also available on YouTube. So I think we're going to stop there. We'd really like to engage in a QA and a um, with you folks about this. We have a website. I've got the QR code for the website here. And I'd really encourage you to go check out some of the work um, and tools that we've been developing. But also, one of the reasons that Renee and I are really excited to be here today and we're really eager to engage with this particular audience is that we are always really interested in tool development and communications product development. And so we'd like to, as part of the Q&A, to turn the queue back to you and um, ask if there are, if you guys have ideas about additional types of tools that we could create, products that you might find useful for your work, and um, information, types of information that you would find useful. We would love to hear about it. So um, I'm just going to leave this page up so that you guys can get access to our website, and um, Renee and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. We have a question about the per site costs of monitoring and analysis. So the GoPro Hero 3 Plus Silver cameras are, are a model that's not available anymore, but it was a $300 purchase, I think, when we bought those. And we still have them, and we've been working with them for, for five years, so it, it was a good investment for us. 
Um, so certainly we would, well, we would deploy um, eight cameras per site. So there was an investment, I would say, of a couple thousand dollars to get the, the camera equipment. We made a lot of things in-house. Um, Dylan Bedman was our field, one of our field technicians, um, built a lot of, of stuff for us for mounting the cameras on the cages. For analysis, Julie mentioned this, we use Observer XT behavioral software that's made by a company called Moldus. And that was a bit of an investment as well, but it was very worth it for us because we can view both camera views at the same time when we do our fish abundance counts and our behavior assessments. There is, I would like to mention, though, there is a freeware video analysis software that's called Boris, which is the behavioral observation research something software, B-O-R-I-S. And so um, uh, some of our partner, our colleagues who are doing similar work in other locations around the country have been using Boris. But I know that Boris, you can do side by side. Um, uh, I think you can do uh, uh, time synced videos, but um, Noldis, the Observer XT has some additional functionality like the ability to speed up or slow down videos. And then also it creates logs of scored videos that we have found really useful in order to be able to go back for scoring. So like basically the way our analysis work stream works, our workflow works is um, my, our colleagues Jillian Phillips and, and Paul Clark will analyze the data for or analyze the video for abundance. And then we go back and analyze for um, behavior. But we're only doing it for a subset of species, and sometimes we're only doing it for a subset of videos. And so having those logs of where we know the fish occur within our video libraries has made it much more efficient to be able to score behavior. So I think like Boris has worked really well um, for our colleagues, and um, depending on the type of uh, questions, research questions that you're asking, I think Boris would be totally fine. One thing I will say, Meg, is that um, the it's relatively easy to collect video, and it is very time consuming to analyze it. And so um, that is the labor cost associated with video analysis can be substantial. Um, I think we've been able to leverage interns, and we've been able to leverage uh, partners. One thing that we always get asked about is um, AI. Um, because there are certainly some fisheries applications that are able to use AI tools um, that uh, that have streamlined workflow for some fisheries monitoring. But unfortunately, for the type of videos that we collect, where there's a lot of stuff in our video that is moving that is not fish, um, that has made it really challenging for most of the AI, the AI um, applications that are out there that we've been able to look at. To date. <clears throat> well, it looks like Doug has been typing for a while. There might be some other people typing, but um, <clears throat> yeah, if anyone else has a question, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, a couple other people are typing as well. Um, and, and maybe while we're waiting, I have a question for you. This is Maggie. Um, uh, yeah, so I love the um, communication and uh, resources you made for kids, like how oyster farms can create homes for fish and things like that. You know, what would you imagine, you know, educators and aquarium, people who work at aquariums, how would you envision, you know, an aquarium educator, for example, using these resources um, in their exhibits or on the floor? If you have any like ideal kind of situation you're you're imagining for your products, I mean, I think that we're we'd be we're, we'd be very interested in partnering with folks. You know, um, educational outreach is not something that either of us are trained in, and so I think it's really critical that we be able to partner with professionals who do this work. And this is part of the reason that I asked the question or that we asked the question, what additional tools can we create? Because we don't, you know, we've been working with some very talented communication specialists. Um, and I think we have some wonderful um, in-house experience, but we don't necessarily have like the on the ground experience to know what folks need. And so it would be really wonderful, you know, to partner with people um, in the field to hear what types of tools 
would most benefit them. And certainly if anybody um, has a, a shellfish aquaculture display, um, this handout for kids would be a great complement to that because it really um, kind of conceptualizes some things that are difficult to explain without seeing them. Yeah, and I think just this is part of the reason we've been trying to create videos like this day in the field videos and like working with TNC on their on their video is, you know, it's just we find the videos so compelling and people are just really drawn to them. And so I think um, the more that we can share just what we've seen and what farms look like underwater, I feel that it could have a positive effect on some community, coastal community conversations that are happening around aquaculture. Um, I think I saw a uh, message, okay, so a question from Doug, so I'll read it out loud um, if those, for those of you who may be on the phone. So in California, we tend to see regulators invoke California exceptionalism where they reject the findings of studies that are not explicitly cited in the areas of interest. What world do you see for a larger data set um, multiple studies, locations of these types of positive ecosystem studies to build the case for regulators. So Doug, I love your question and I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Recently, I have a colleague with the Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office, um, Chris Galachi, who's the regional aquaculture, one of the regional aquaculture coordinators in the Northeast. And Chris come, came out of the regulatory community um, in Massachusetts before becoming a regional aquaculture coordinator. So Chris and I are really interested in doing um, synthesis work to look at region scale eco shellfish, eco shellfish aquaculture ecosystem services. Um, so we've started working in the Northeast and we're looking at synthesizing nutrient um, removal data across the region. And we're also interested in synthesizing uh, habitat provisioning data that's being collected across the region. And so in the Northeast, what we've been able to do is partner with um, colleagues at Rutgers University, so Daphne Monroe's team at Rutgers, as well as um, Steve Kirk with TNC in Massachusetts and John Grabowski's team at Northeastern University. All three of our groups are collecting data on oyster farms um, using similar methods um, and similar approaches. And what we're hoping is that by covering a broader geographic range, so going from New Jersey all the way up through southern New England, but we'll be able to start to see some large-scale trends that will give regulators confidence that, um, that services are being provided consistently in time and in space. Um, so I would love to talk about this more. I would love to give a whole seminar on this maybe like a year from now because <laughs> this project is just getting going, but I'm very, very passionate about it and I'm really excited about the opportunity to develop regulatory specific tools based on um, around aquaculture ecosystem services. Um, and Alicia, thanks for reaching out. Please feel free. Um, our website, or sorry, our emails are on the project website, but Noah's easy. It's just julie.rose at noah.gov and yeah, renee.mercaldoallen at noah.gov. So please feel free to reach out. Turn my video back on. Does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, it was really cool to see the videos. Um, love, love seeing it in action. So I want to picture them also on like exhibits and in aquariums where people can see this happening. Um, that would be great. Yeah. Look like we have another person we typing. See, yeah. Yeah, we've just seen so many cool things. It's really remarkable. Um, yeah, it's been, this has been one of the most fun projects I've ever worked on. Well, do you know if other people in other regions are doing something similar or is it like, you know, in the Pacific Northwest or is this, have you all, it's only in the New England area right now? No, so um, I think I mentioned a, a few slides back that um, yeah. there, we have colleagues at the Pacific, up in the Pacific Northwest. So Gus Sanderson and Bridget Ferris have been doing work in Puget Sound in Washington State and they've been collecting video 
or they collected video up there for a few years. Um, and so they have a video library and a publication related to that as well. Um, and I think recently I've heard that there's some effort to get video collection going in um, Alaska. Um, so Alex Leferrier has been, uh, at, who's at NOAA's um, Kodiak lab um, up in Alaska, has been doing some pilot scale work with cameras up there as well. Um, also, I should mention, too, that there are a few people that are doing work with seaweed. So we've just been working with um, oyster farms, but there is a woman out of um, the University of New England named Carrie Byron who's been collecting video on seaweed farms. Um, and I think there's been some work done in Long Island Sound as well um, from the Norwalk Aquarium. Yep. We have a question oh, about yeah. favorite fish yeah. seen in videos. So I'm a big flounder fan, and we've gotten some great <laughs> flounder footage, which we did not include here, which may have been a mistake. <laughs> I just really like scup. I think they're cool. I think they do cool stuff, and I, I don't know why. There's just something about scup that I just like. <laughs> oh, Meg, yeah, please look up Carrie. She's had a project going for a few years now, and she'd be happy to chat with you, I'm sure, about um, – working with kelp. It's definitely, um, it can be challenging. I think from conversations with Carrie, my impression is that um, it can be challenging because the environment changes so much. Like the, you know, the oyster cages are fairly static, but the kelp farm changes hugely during the course of the growing season, right? So you have like early in the season where there's not much going on, and then you have like a huge mass of material that develops over time. Um, and I think also like trying to, we have a static cage that is stable and so we can clip cameras onto it and they're stable and that makes the video relatively easy to watch but you know with a kelp farm you run into a challenge of um, you can position the cameras on the seafloor if the water is not too deep and then that gives you a stable view like looking up at the farm but if a lot of these kelp farms are in deeper water where that's not really going to be possible because of like light limitation and so I think there's been some effort to clip lines like to hang lines from um, from the you know from the uh, horizontal long lines right or create a mounting system that's a suspended mounting system but then that can make for very like nausea inducing videos is sort of the sense that I've gotten yeah so I think that it's definitely possible Carrie's done it um, to get video, but I think that kelp farms pr uh, pr uh, produce some challenges that um, oyster farms don't have. And did you all see that Meg also had a question about um, what issues can you imagine adapt adapting to this new environment, waving kelp fronts, obscuring views? Yeah, it's a, kelp farms are definitely harder than oyster farms. We've got it easy. Um, you know, I think if you, you know, late in the season where you have these really dense um, fronds, you know, it can make it difficult to see um, the fish. You know, there's just a lot more 3D structure than we necessarily have to deal with. Um, yeah, yep. Kelp is definitely harder. <laughs> Hey, does anyone else have any questions before we call it a day? All right, well, not hearing anything. Um, after waiting a few seconds, I think we're well, probably good to wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Renee and Julie. Um, I'll thank Brianna offline for inviting you. Uh, it was really interesting and we had a really good turnout. Um, so if anyone would like to be in touch with you, I think you provided your email addresses, so please feel free to reach out. Um, and the recording will be posted in a few days and we'll be in touch with those of you on the listserv about when our next webinar will be and what it will entail. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night or rest of your day if you're on the West Coast or a bit earlier. Thank so. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>